As an entrepreneur, you know what's at stake when you take a risk. But what happens when it all goes sideways? You gotta start over and keep grinding. Today's guest is Narendra Singh. He's a serial entrepreneur who's lived it all, from massive success to dot-com bust, and then back to doing it all over again. He'll reveal what he learned from that downfall and how he rose from the ashes to eventually find great success as a business leader and much more. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you'll learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Jason Maynard, the SVP of marketing at Oracle NetSuite and the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your own journey of growth. Before we get into our interview with Narendra Singh, I want to quickly thank Ring for sponsoring this GrowWire podcast episode. If you don't know about Ring, you definitely should. Their products are based on a simple principle. Use your existing home Wi-Fi network to create a ring of security around your home. By hooking up to your Wi-Fi, Ring has a video doorbell for your smartphone. So whenever somebody approaches your house or comes in the range of your security camera, you can view a video or even talk to that person. I use Ring at my house. It's great when somebody's going to drop a package off or somebody rings your door and you're not home. You can always stay in control of what's happening in and around your house. Now you can get your hands on a Ring video doorbell too at a discounted price. Just go to www.ring.com and use the promo code GROW20RING. That's GROW20RING. Use it at checkout for $20 off a video doorbell two and do it fast. This promotion only lasts through the end of July. I also want to make sure you head over to our website, growwire.com, growwire.com. Check it out. There's a lot of great stuff. You're going to find some articles about growing your big ideas in your business, and you might even learn something about how you can grow in your career. My favorite article this week, and this is a very passionate one for me, it features the owner of Wahoo's Fish Tacos. Now, if you don't live in LA or Southern California, you are missing out. Wahoo's is a legendary taco chain, great fish tacos. I always go to the one on Wilshire, kind of Wilshire and 4th Street, my favorite place. You should go check out growwire.com. Find out about the one rule that he believes in most when it comes to boosting your business. It's probably something you won't expect and you're gonna get hungry and you're gonna want a fish taco. Check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Grow Wire podcast. I'm your host, Jason Maynard. I have a very special guest with me today, Mr. Narinder Singh. Narinder is an entrepreneur, technologist, nonprofit exec, and now he's on to a new phase of his career. Narinder, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. It's great to have you here. So tell everybody a little bit about your background so they understand where you came from. Sure. Today, as you said, I'm trying to explore opportunities in healthcare and technology, trying to use AI to improve medical decision making. Prior to that, um, how we met was I started a company with a bunch of others called Aperio, which was a cloud computing company that helped accelerate the adoption of cloud computing in large enterprises. And we also had a crowdsourcing community called TopCoder that was a million developers, designers, and data scientists. So we were really looking to change how work got done and how innovation got delivered to companies. Before that, I was in corporate strategy at SAP, worked in the CEO's office, I worked at a startup called Web Methods that was a dot-com boom and bust. I worked at a company called Accenture, their center for strategic technology, and I got a couple degrees along the way. So that's my professional background in a a nutshell. We're going to hit some of those stories and some of the lessons learned. But first, maybe tell us a little bit about where you grew up and your childhood (laughs) and how you got here today. Sure. So it's often hard to guess as you look at me in my stylish pink turban and beard that I might be from someplace besides the coast, but I'm actually from Cincinnati, Ohio. So I proudly say that I grew up a Bengals fan, and I'm still yeah. a Bengals fan, which is a long life, but it shows my dedication to, to the cause. And um, we were, you know, my parents were immigrants. They came to this country. My dad took a job working for as a civil engineer for the state of Ohio for 30 years and then retired. Where are they from? Um, they're from Punjab, which is in northern India yep. today. And so they were, you know, really just trying to figure it out. Like they always had a business on the side, whether it be a grocery store, a video business. We sold phone cards. So they were always working plus doing something entrepreneurial. And um, that led to, you know, a little different experience. I signed myself up for baseball. I signed myself up for basketball because they were just really busy and they didn't really understand what the norms were. And so it was a fantastic experience in a lot of ways. But, you know, the Midwest has a genuineness 
that you I really admire to this day, and you see a sincerity even amongst executives from there. At the same time, you know, especially with kids, it can be a little closed-minded. And so being an immigrant, looking a little different was sometimes, you know, not the easiest path. And so for me, one of the kind of fundamental things was that when I was a teenager, we moved schools, which is hard in its own. Yeah. I'm going to middle school. Uh, a friend of mine says that if you liked middle school, you probably have no soul. <laughs> right? Every kid is awkward, and yeah. it's really awkward if you're a little different. And so for me, my sanctuary became really a, a martial arts studio that I joined. Oh, wow. So it was something that I did from the time I was about 14 to probably my mid-20s or so. So you could go full Cobra Kai and all those kids giving you grief? We were Team Miyagi, for sure. Oh, right? Miyagi, like, okay, you know, that's we good. We were yeah. trying to be the... We were definitely not, not... But you could throw down if you had to. Yeah, and I mean, the, the funny thing becomes is you become more comfortable in that realm. You feel less of a need to. Yeah. Right? Like, at the beginning, that's exactly why you start. Like, hey, people are picking on you. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let that happen anymore. And as you start to become more comfortable with who you are you tend to not have to do it to prove yourself. So that was like really formative for me because like, you know, I was 15, 16 years old and leading classes of people, oh, right? Wow. Of much older than me because it was not based on how old you were. It was experience you had in that, how fast you were accelerating. And so again, it was like a, important notions of what structure and leadership looked like. It made me think that aspiration was not tied to years of service, Yeah. right? And so it was really kind of fundamental and transformative for me as a young adult to come into who I was. And so it really enforced in a lot of ways what I believe as a person, um, my own values, my values from religion, but they were all kind of manifested itself through that martial arts studio. So that was really transformative for me growing up. Was there anybody there who had a major influence yeah, on David you? David Huffstetler, to this day, um, I, I'll tweet this podcast out to him. We still connect via social media. He was... Um, not there the first month I joined because he had basically signed up for the National Guard. So he himself was only a couple years older than me. He was in college and decided he wanted to join the National Guard. In fact, our studio was out of the, the National Guard armory. And so David, um, you know, I learned a lot from him about discipline, about having a really strong work ethic, mm -hmm. but still having fun. Like we, like he had a clear sense of we were allowed to not have fun and work hard and then flip the switch because now we're not in the studio. We get a chance to enjoy life. And so David um, really was instrumental in a lot of ways for me. That's great. So talk about, did you know what you wanted to do going into college? And, you know, was, was that something that was, that was important in your early, early years? You know, I did, but I was wrong. And what I mean by that is I basically went from being this shy, quiet kid to really coming out of my shell because I was like, I'm not going to be embarrassed of who I am. And I started getting into all these activities that were very outward facing. So, for example, one of the activities I got into in high school that was also transformative was mock trial. So huh. you'd go and pretend to do a legal case and you'd be a lawyer and you'd act like you were on TV. So I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. So I was the captain of the mock trial team in high school. I was the captain of the mock trial team in college. I was a civil engineering major because my dad said, if you do that, you can get a job anywhere. Like you can live geographically anywhere. That was kind of appealing because yeah. I was ready to get out of my tight circle at that point. So I went to school thinking, yeah, I'm an engineering major, but I don't really care. Right. And so I did get into technology and computers and programming a bit, but that's what led me to say, well, maybe I want to be an IP lawyer. Um, you know, did not, you, did you apply to law school? I came out to the Valley. Right. And so my first job, I was like, well, let me get, I wasn't the best of students. Right. I was kind of hit or miss. Like there weren't a lot of B's on my report card. It was A's and C's related to kind of interest level that yeah. I was, what I was into. For example, um, I, I did not do so well in soil mechanics one or two. <laughs> I don't even you, know what that is, but that it is a sound fundamental like... part of civil engineering, yeah. <laughs> but I did quite well in con law one, two engineering law and all these kinds of classes. Um, along with some of the programming and math ones. So I basically came out here thinking that I'd get two years of work experience and apply to law school. Okay. So this is 95, right? Okay. And so that's the plan. I start applying to law school, but the internet is starting to take off. Like we've got Yahoo, we've got Pointcast, we have all these crazy things happening. And it just kind of dawned on me that do I want to go back to school for three years and start at a place where everybody can tell me, I've been doing this for 20 years, son. This is how this is done. Yeah. Right. Or do I want to be at a place where literally with my couple years of experience, I'm at the forefront. And so I got through the applications. I didn't submit. So I got the recommendations, took the LSAT, did everything and pulled on the goal line. And so, I, yeah. And so I, how, how did you end up then in technology? So my job was in technology. I joined at the Center for Strategic Technology because I was an engineering major. Okay. They're like, OK, fine. 
And so we were in this little glass room on Page Mill Road, and basically they'd bring in executives from around the country to watch us write on the clear windows and see how radical the thinking was. <laughs> and we were building basically integrations from ERP technology to the Internet. Oh, so wow. that was my first job where I really – I had technology jobs in, in college, but this is the first job where I coded all day. Oh, wow. Okay, and this is when you were at Accenture? Accenture. Okay. Accenture. So you're – was it Accenture back then? It was Anderson Consulting so, and switched to Accenture right then, at the okay. time. But I always said I worked at the Center for Strategic Technology. It sounded cool. It does sound very cool. Very it sounds prestigious. very official. Very prestigious. Very prestigious. As, as prestigious as any 22-year-old who's you know, doing a little more than getting coffee and writing. Lots of leather-bound books in the, in the entryway. We right? had glass windows we glass, wrote on. Oh, wow. It was very cool. Oh, you guys were, you guys were all ahead like, of our times. Wow. If you've ever met a famous athlete at a corporate event or gotten an official autograph, chances are Steiner Sports made it happen. Here's Brandon Steiner. We believe that there's magic in the moments that sports creates. We get customers closer to the game and help companies use the power of sports to grow their business. We've been in business 30 years and we've had multiple systems to keep track of all the athletes and all of our customers. Multiple systems means multiple headaches. So we made the move to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite lets us replace all of our finance, inventory, and CRM functions with one convenient system. Now all the departments can see the same data. And if I have a question about our business, I can get the answer quickly. This month, NetSuite is offering a free 60-minute business review with an expert in your industry to identify opportunities to turbocharge your growth. To get your free review, go to netsuite.com slash steiner. That's netsuite.com slash steiner. netsuite.com slash steiner. You had a, had a pretty crazy experience with a company called Web Methods. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, that was one of the in the you know late '90s, you know, darlings, and then and then unfortunately a boom and bust kind of story. Talk about what that was like, because that that's a fascinating period of time. It's funny because today it's history. Now people don't remember what that, that was. Just like. means you're an old man, dude. You're just an old man. The beard's got a little gray in it. I know a little bit, a little less than yours though. Mine, so. did, mine's got a lot of gray now, actually. So basically, I had left Accenture. I'd worked on this integration technology. I was working on technology. So I, I went to this conference. I sought out the founder and I said, hey, I work on integration. You guys seem cool. And he's like, yeah, you should interview. And, you know, four weeks later, I'm there. And I was like employee number 30 something. I was one of the first five employees on the West Coast, which we were opening. And the company was a rocket ship. Like we grew to about at our peak, about 1500 people. I was able to, like, you were just giving opportunities that were way above you. So they are like, you had worked on three projects that involved this technology. Why don't you create a product around that, even though you've never done that? Here's a team of 15 people. So I was 25 running a team of probably 70 people, and I created a product that became the most successful product in the company's history, aside from what it was based on. What did, what did you guys actually build? We built core integration technology that connected, like, you know, internal systems, external systems. And I built a platform called Trading Networks that let you connect to your business partners. Okay. So you'd connect like your one database to another database and now this lets you and connect then to somebody. All sorts of insider baseball like RosettaNet or EDI okay. or all these exchanges. Anything that was intercompany exchange was the product I built um, or led for that company. And so we eventually went public. So we went public and our stock opened at one eighty nine. It was the largest open of the year. It peaked at $336 a share, and then within the next seven months, it was at $6 a share. So if you wow. take a number and you divide it by 55, it becomes a much, much smaller number, <laughs> right? It's a little bit of math that everybody can, can relate yeah. to. And it was traumatizing emotionally and culturally for the company, but even physically, some people had exercised shares and had this thing called AMT and had a tax bill that was more money than they would probably make in the next 20 years. So it was absolutely devastating culturally for the company. And you could see that just the expectations that people had were that I'm going to retire. This is going to be the last job I ever yeah. had. That was true for most of the company. I think 98% of the company at 3:30 at opening bell was a millionaire. By the time we went to 3:36, everybody was a millionaire yeah. right on paper. Yeah. And very few actually realized that. Yeah. So it was um sometimes say it felt like John Travolta and Welcome Bot Cotter 
Welcome back, Kata. If you want to, you I know. think that's a Cincinnati, Ohio reference. Maybe. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> WKRP then, you know, in Cincinnati. I, it took me ten years to find my Pulp Fiction, yeah. right? Because you you have some modicum of success, and then you go to basically nothing, yeah. right? And you kind of start over to some extent, and you go from being everyone's darling to something else. I remember very vividly, I went to a friend's engagement party, and it, they were both families were doctors, and every doctor was like, like on me they were like should i buy this stock i'm trying to get my kids to not go to medical school like and i was like hey look i don't know what's gonna happen you should do what you want i get to the wedding which is about nine months later and i'm like a pariah <laughs> they're like they're, they look at me like i told them to put money in the company and it was just an interesting time of like discovering who you were what you were actually caring about was it this notion of the numbers or were you in it because you wanted to build something interesting yeah. so what how do you come out of that you know, I think one is it helped being young because it wasn't like I had a lifestyle and had to adjust from that lifestyle. But for me, it made me really think about I had to be I was passionate about what we did and that actually carried through. Yeah. And so instead of being bitter because I was working at no offense, the fourth pets dot com. I was working on something I believed in from a technology perspective that actually held true. And so it made me want to understand what happened. It's actually what led me. I did an executive MBA at Wharton while I was at Web Methods because one, I was praying the stock would come back. Didn't happen. And two, I wanted to understand what happened. So for me, the lesson was really care about what you're looking at. Take something away from that experience. I look at my years at Web Methods as some of the best of my career. The friendships, the people, everybody I met. In retrospect, yeah, it was an incredible experience. But honestly, even then, I wasn't like despondent because I really cared about what we were doing, the people I met. And so it really made me focus on, you can't, it's just life's too short to focus on just trying to make a buck. Yeah. What other, what other things did you learn? It's interesting. You went back to school during that time. What, was there, was there anything in school that you're like, <laughs> oh, if we would, if, if I had just taken Mr. Johnson's <laughs> cash flow ca class six months earlier, uh, we would have done a hundred things. Like, was there anything like that? that there, you... I mean, sure. The accounting and finance ones. And I'll give you the one that made me look, really think about this. There was a day when web methods market cap was higher than the top four or five airlines combined. And I was sitting in a finance class looking at an airline's balance sheet, income statement, like what they do. Yeah. And I was like, bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> it really gave me a different sense of it. it, it was, Web Methods was really, um, really, really seductive because we knew there was a bubble. But we also knew we weren't the fourth pets.com. Yeah. We were actually a real technology that had huge. I mean, we were that generation's MuleSoft. Yeah. Right. So we knew there was something real there. We just didn't manifest it because of circumstance, because of our own execution. So that made that lesson actually more painful. It's not about just having a good business. There's many other things that are way beyond your control that you also need to consider when you're in the entrepreneurial phase. Yeah. So. You go through that experience. It's obviously a great lesson. How do you then decide to, I want to go start another company? What was the motivation by, behind starting Aperia? You know, so I went from Web Methods and I went to Corporate Strategy at SAP. And this is where, in reflection, you like to think that you're independent and different from your parents and you're doing all these things differently. I look at my path now and it makes me have a little different lens on them. Because if you would have asked me at... 28. Hey, what did you get from your parents? I'd be like, our experience is totally different. My dad had one job. I flip around. It's totally different. But if you look at the path, you know, my, they had a business on the side. So my dad had a very stable job, but they were always entrepreneurial. You look at me, I, at that point, I went and got an MBA. You know, it was like risk mitigation. I went and worked in corporate strategy at SAP. So in fact, I'd created my own version of risk mitigation. Yeah. So Aperio could have went and failed. And it would have been fine. Somebody would have hired me for sure yeah. at that point. Yep. It was well past the curve of my career. And so, you know, I say that, one, I have a lot of respect for people who do it without that safety net. Like, I think my experience is very different as a result. But it made me think about who I was as a person and what influences you in a really different way than people sometimes attribute all their own actions to themselves. So that's the backdrop for this. The interesting part about the actual founding is the guys I started with, there, was, there were four of us, and we all worked together at Web Methods. Oh, wow. Okay. So you look at like the, the symmetry, and it, I knew they were smart. Um, I didn't, we weren't best friends at Web Methods, but we were friends. Yeah. A couple of us, two of us had worked closely together. And 
I had an immense professional respect for them and I knew I liked them. And we had a shared sense of values that we wanted to reinforce and a few things that we knew we wanted to change. So we had a shared context, um, even though when we started the company, one was in California, I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one was in Atlanta, and one was in D.C. So four guys from four different parts of the country, very different backgrounds, came together to start a company. And the common experience of web methods, I really believe, was instrumental in helping us cohesive very quickly. And did you guys all scatter post web methods to different companies then? So three of the guys were at Borland okay. and I was at Corporate Strategy at SAP. Okay. So that we had scattered a bit um, and we had all left within a relatively uh, tight t- time frame. So Aperio was one of the first companies who focused on delivering services around, back then we called it on-demand computing <laughs> yeah. and what the kids call cloud today. But ha, ha, like, like what's the, what was the mindset back then to say, okay, we're going to start, you went from working at product companies mm-hmm. to saying, well, actually, we're going to go build a services company around this new technology. So, how, how do you, so, how do you so get to two, there? Two things. One is you think one thing when you're starting, another happens differently. We looked and said, we believe in on-demand cloud. Yeah what's going to fundamentally change. And we said the ecosystem of services needs to change. And so we thought we were building a company to disrupt services and we were going to build product, have uh, product that we sold, had IP that we used our engagements and services. So we thought we were doing all of them and we were, we actually built a product. This is an interesting part of the, the story is that we built a product that was for professional services that was doing okay while our services business was going crazy. Yeah. And that's really more a reflection of those two businesses. Nothing about one being good or bad. Product businesses just take longer. So we. How fast was the services business growing? We went um, our first year. We we were in in sales three million, ten million, twenty million. So kind of a crazy rocket ship. And the wow. first year and a half of that was all bootstrapped. So we didn't raise money for for the majority of the first two years of the company. How do you manage a company growing that fast? So couple things, and um, in our normal conversation, four questions at once out. Yeah. So one thing is that we really believed in what we were doing, so we ran the entire company on the cloud. So a period from zero to 1,200, I think, was our peak. We had not a single server in the company. That's amazing. So we actually did what we said customers should do yeah. and what the future was. And it wasn't just lip service. It actually transformed how we could implement culture in a virtual company because the company eventually had offices, our two biggest offices had probably 500 employees, but even at the end, the majority of the company worked remotely. And so we did that from the beginning, and the technology let us do that. The second thing is that, remember I talked about web methods. At web methods, our kind of values, what we took to hire, were, were passion, integrity, and neurons in excess. I still remember that to this day. Yeah. In the first three months of Aperio, we decided what they were for Aperio. Professionalism, trust, and gray matter. Kind of sounds familiar, yeah. have some nuanced differences, but we set those principles as the values of the company and then manifested in every way. So for example, one of my co-founders, as soon as we said that, that became in our in our cloud app became how we interviewed. So we rated people on those three criteria, overall recommendation. Oh, wow. So that was true for probably 4,000 interviews. People got rated that way and it was set in the first 90 days of the company. And that enabled you to maintain your hiring quality and integrity, even though you guys weren't in the same spot and you were virtualized and remote. It right? sounds really smart in retrospect. And I think in prospect, it was not <laughs> nearly as well thought out as it sounds now, because we knew we had a shared context and we knew we really liked that part of web methods and we wanted to carry it over. Yeah. So, it, you know, it was really as simple as that. Yes, we knew culture was important. But did we understand how much that would manifest itself in who we were as a company five years later? Not a chance. Well, this this is this raises an interesting question because and I and I know the answer a bit here, but I think you make this point all the time, which is when you start a company, you have certain assumptions that you think are going to hold true, mm-hmm. and then the reality is what makes you successful oftentimes is somewhat accidental. Yes. So talk about your accidental, yeah. accidental, brilliant decision making. So a few things. First, I'm going to finish a, a story finish that relates away, yeah. to this. You asked about the company. So one of the things or assumptions was that we were going to be a product and services yeah. company, right? So I mentioned we built this product. It was doing fine, but nothing like what was happening. And what we did is there were two things. We discovered like our services business, we were at the center of the cloud industry for a company of 
less than 100, probably 50 or 60 people, we were getting calls from major companies, major vendors. Everybody wanted us because we were telling them what was going to happen in the future. Yeah. Our, serv- our product business was one small product for professional services. And so it was, it was a little bit, you catch on to the high, right? And so we sold that product off, and I don't know the numbers, but I'm sure it's still half their revenue. Like, and they will probably have as big or bigger outcome than Aperio did, uh, in large part because of what they did with the product afterwards, but the inception yeah. around that product. And so on one hand, you can say, like, we made a huge strategic decision, a little bit because we were, you know, kind of high on the juice of being at the center of the industry. Now, that was honestly still the right decision for our company because of who we were culturally at that time, the skills we had and the like. But that's an example of a decision that we made with a very narrow window that had immensely broad implications, yeah. right? And it, it, on one hand, it let us focus. And so we became who we were. On the other hand, we gave away um, at a very, at a, we basically gave away a very valuable asset in the long term, right? And so you make these decisions all the time that have massive ramification. Like when you're early in the company, you make a, dis- like we, when, when we were hiring our first few employees, we would make these decisions on their equity grants in five seconds. And that grant that we gave them was the entire, you know, board discussion six years later on, should we increase the employee pool by this much or this much? Yeah. So the ramifications of those decisions had such downstream things. We talked about the culture one. We talked about the working remote one. I'll tell another one. The first time somebody quit Aperio, like a couple of the guys were, were, were pissed. They were upset, right? And we were very explicit about that was one thing about as people were leaving web methods, a lot of times they were disparaged as they were leaving, right? Oh, Their contributions. And it was something were that you guys a couple, angry? People, not, no, not the people leaving. It was like, oh, hey, you, you had a lot of contributions to the company in the early days. Like, there are things like that that would oh, okay. come across. And look, because people were like, hey, you have to be loyal. So we used that experience to say, no, no, no. People are not loyal to the company. The company is not like family. Your family is your family. Yeah. And so we said, that's true from day one of Aperio, and we acknowledge that. So we said, we're going to do the best thing we can to make it so that you can focus on what's most important in your life, which is your family, right? Interesting. We're going to be the best way to spend the other nine or 10 hours. I used to tell people every time is that in six months after you accept a job at Aperio, you're going to go home. I'm going to ask your spouse, and, and he or she is going to say, you're working harder than you did before, but you're happier than you've ever been, and that makes you better at home. That's what we want to have happen. And so when people left that early day, we said, no, no, this is a hard hire. We're sad they're leaving. We are not, we're going to celebrate whatever they want to do next. Yeah. Because they're making a choice that's the best choice for them and their family. And who are we to get in the way of that? Yeah. So those are examples of things that we did early on that had huge ramifications around that. More specifically to the business is we were very, we we're hustlers, right? Because yeah. you have to be, everybody who's listening to this has, has been an entrepreneur, knows what it's like. You got to hustle. And so we would say yes to things, build things that we weren't sure we could build um, on the outer edge. Like we would never, we would never lie to people and we would never do something that we didn't think aspirationally we could get to. So we had built some demos for our partner at the time, which was salesforce.com. And we had built these demos, gotten a customer, and we were, again, 50, 80 people. And they were already starting to partner with the behemoths and services. Mm-hmm. But we built something on a bleeding edge technology that they had just re- released and got a customer to do a concept around it. It was Dolby. And so there's this thing called the Dolby demo. And if you talk to early Salesforce people, they would be like, I am sick of Narinder and Mark Benioff Doing presenting the, the Dolby demo. Because <laughs> Mark and I presented it once. He liked it. I probably did that a dozen times around the world. You were, you were like the king of all demos, like yeah. in 2005 to 2007. 2007 to yeah. 9, 10. Yeah. You know, that demo led to another one. And I probably presented with him 30 or 40, yeah. maybe 20 or 30 times around the world over those three or four yeah. years, right? And um, that obviously elevated the stature of the company, but it was really kind of this side thing that we did where we made one smart decision was that we're not going to spend marketing dollars on advertising and podcasts they didn't exist then no <laughs> we said we're going to build demos with technology because nobody's seen this stuff ever worked yeah. before so that was a smart decision the rest was luck and i think that's the thing that people really miss and take away um a business book that i like and other people love and i like less because other people love 
is a book by Ben Horowitz, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah. He's a great writer. I love his rap references. And the book is very good. I look upon that book more negatively now because of the reaction I perceive people took from that. Like they show the stories like it's all about persistence. He just persisted through the company was about to die and he persisted. And that's the lesson they take away that it's all about persistence. There's no doubt persistence is important, but there's for every story like that, there's a story where that two week window didn't happen and the company folded. Yeah. Right. I have a close, good friend of mine who told me a story of one, a dot com story he had, and then he held on to the company for another four years. And he's like, I should have let go. And so my point is not be less persistent. My point is my advice to anybody on this podcast is, you know, you get what you pay for with advice, including this one. Yeah. Right. So you've got to take and apply the lessons to your context. The lessons that worked for me may not work for you. In fact, we were very adamant at Aperio just because something worked really well or didn't work at all. That was only a data point as to if we should do that or not two years later. Yeah, you can't look at a, you can't look at a past textbook or or somebody else's experience and say that's how i'm going to craft my own strategy right yeah you have i mean i I think they're incredible inputs read learn yeah that to me is a a fundamental aspect of who you should be as a person and we'll talk about that as in terms of advice but you need to eventually apply that to your own context right nobody can substitute for your own thinking well and you you got to make your own decisions about what you're going to do and you can't look at somebody else's path and say, okay, well, they made that decision, so I'm going to make this decision. Yeah, And, and you have to be accountable for your own decisions. Yeah. One of the things is that I think I, it, I'm accountable for when I choose to sell shares or not at Web Methods. It's not my brother-in-law's fault, my, yeah. fi- my finance person's fault. It's my decision. I have to be accountable for that. This episode is also brought to you by our friends at Blue Microphones. I'm on a Blue Microphone right now telling you about Blue Microphones. Isn't that kind of cool? If you are a storyteller and almost everyone is these days, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast or maybe streaming and communicating with your friends on Fortnite or something like that, you need to check out Blue's new Yeti Caster, the complete mic and boom arm system, ready to connect to your laptop. It brings the ultimate broadcast studio set up to your home or office. Visit bluedesigns.com and use the code podcast. That's podcast at checkout for a special price. I met you guys back when you were starting Aperio and you, you, I will say this, you, your strategy of, of how you were building your, your brand, if you will, was that you guys were the, the cutting edge technologists around software as a service. And so that's where I, I met you guys. And I was yeah. fascinated by what you're doing because I was like, wow, these guys, are, these guys are living it and breathing it. And, and you know, there was nobody like you. I'll tell a practical story, a lesson for entrepreneurs and a practical story about how you and I met. We met at, at the acquisition party of a friend of mine whose company just gotten was- acquired for, by Salesforce. And uh, at the time, you were a big deal. So I don't know what's happened to your career it's since gone then. gone downhill. <laughs> but you were a big deal back then. You were the so I'm f- doing this podcast you, yeah, now. I'm trying to get back. The, you were one of the first guys who was really covering uh, on demand, as we called it back then. And so we wanted to impress you. And you, you, know, you agreed. We went to dinner one time. And uh, you agreed to a second dinner. So me, Chris, my co-founder, you were in our dinner at the, at the sushi place. It's a great place. We had been to before. And you start ordering. And our expense policy in year one and a half of a period oh, no. <laughs> was officially called the slow reach policy. One of our chief architect had registered a domain called slowreach.com. You reach for the bill as slowly as possible. The alligator arms. The alligator arms. You slow it down. But we had agreed, Chris and I, that night, like Jason is important to us. He, he had paid for dinner last time. I bought the first dinner, You right? bought the first dinner. Okay. This is not that expensive a place. This is key to the story. This is key I to did, the story. I did buy the you first dinner. You bought din- the first okay. with your banker expense account. <laughs> we go to a restaurant that we perceive is not that expensive. And we order. And you start ordering. You're like, oh, I used to live up here. They know me. They have a thing in the back of a bottle of mine. You and Chris start drinking. and But it's your bottle, so I assume that part is cheap. That's a good sign. <laughs> Right. And I'm just watching you and Chris are drinking and drinking. I don't drink. So I'm like watching, observing. I'm keenly observing, ordering. We're ordering a bunch of food. The bill comes and it's seven hundred and fifty (laughs) dollars. Now, in 10 years of going to that restaurant, which is an amazing restaurant, it's called Zushi Puzzle. 
I my yeah, average building. San Francisco in the marina, yeah, exactly. right on Lombard. You guys have an advertisement. Go go to go see Roger. He'll st- he's still he's there. He's amazing. My average bill there per person is thirty to fifty dollars. We did seven hundred and fifty across three of us, and you were literally a line item. We had to explain to our co-founders <laughs> on why they couldn't buy that extra laptop for another couple of weeks. We man, just spent seven hundred fifty bucks for you the second time. I but you were a big shot. We had to impress oh, you. Man. But it was interesting. It was this balance of showing that you can play with the big boys, but having that internal hustle yeah. that reminded you that you were there. I'm actually feeling that today. You know, by the time I was at the end of Imperio, and I would go to conferences. You know, a lot of people knew me, right? So it was like, hey, here's Narendra. I knew the executives. You know, I was close with the the CEOs of many of the cloud companies, the CIOs of the big customers. And so now I go to a healthcare conference and people are like, who the bleep are you, right? And at the very beginning, it was a little bit like, well, don't you know who I am, whatever? But then you think about it and you're like, actually, this is the way it should be. This whole notion of, you know, Mark Benioff sometimes talks about beginner's mind yeah. and really having that. That applies to how you approach a, a problem, but also I think to the humility you should have for any industry. So that humility, even as we got to be a bigger deal at Aperio, we carried through. We met with everybody that would meet with us. We didn't say, hey, you're an executive, you're two levels down, I'm going to proportionally spend time with you in that way. We spent time with people we thought were smart and got the vision. And eventually, many of those people became executives. Yeah. Right? You got to invest in those folks, right? Yeah. And yeah. so we, and we didn't do it strategically. We did it because it just felt right. And, and I think that, again, really kind of held true for us as being a, a, the North Star for the company. So, just for, so folks understand, Apira had a great outcome. Yeah. Wipro made the acquisition. Phenomenal yeah. outcome for all the investors and employees. And it, it, it was, I will say this, is that as a Are founder, you-, you always have to feel a little bit like what if. And yeah. what I mean by this, that is this, is that the investors did fine, right? They're actually my least concern, yeah. right? Um, the early employees, the founders, the uh, many of the employees did very well. That's very meaningful for me, right? The company today at Wipro is its own division. They're trying, like Chris, who's the CEO. Chris Barbin. Chris Barbin, who's my co-founder and the CEO of Aperio, is the chief culture officer and trying to change the culture of Wipro, and they're embracing that, yeah. right? So I feel good about all those things. I feel good about many of those things where you feel like, what if I I said at the beginning, we started the company to change how services worked in computing. Yeah. And we fell short of that. Right. Like we, we kind of, we changed some companies, you know, and what happened there is that we didn't have a second act. We said the cloud is different. You need a different way of doing things. And at the beginning, Accenture Deloitte fought us. And eventually they're like, yeah, we think that too. And so the worst thing that ever happened to us was that the big guys actually got on board yeah. of what we had been saying from day one, and we didn't have an effective enough response. So we, we started some things. We tried our IP strategy. Um, we Crowdsourcing, I still believe in. We needed more runway. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, you still think about the what-ifs of yeah, it. Yeah, no, you, and... and- Let's 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 dive into the crowdsourcing piece of it because I think that was that was one of the more innovative, interesting ideas. It, it and you guys made a move to do something that people kind of talked about, and there was some use of crowdsourcing for development, a bunch of things. But you guys were trying to scale this at at a, at a level nobody really seen. And and it's it's amazing like how your stories connect. And I'll talk about how I'd like to talk a little bit about the founding of Aperio in a second with parts. But the stories connect here for me is that. We had started a crowdsourcing community. What that meant is that people that were not our employees would participate in design, development, and data science challenges to build software. Yep. So we take a big project, break it down, and people would compete. Um, and it was great. Like people would from all over the world. Like this woman who's like, "Hey, you know, my husband's a little bit of a derelict. Now I'm the primary breadwinner because of Top Coder." And That's now amazing. I'm yeah. like leading the family, and we loved that. Like it's you know it was amazing because. On Top Coder, it was really hard. You didn't know somebody's gender, ethnicity, anything. So people talk, people talk a lot about crowdsourcing and some of the, the, the pros and cons of it. But that, to me, is one of the big pros is it really was merit-based. So, you know, that did very well. And what we did with Top Coder, and it's still doing well. Top Coder is actually still like – so we ran it independently. I was the president of that. There's a gentleman at Wipro now named Mike Morris who's the CEO of Top Coder. And it still has a ton of potential and. Where it left for us is that we were very, very good at solving incredibly hard problems. So NASA, Comcast, all of these rocket science problems, 
like top coder did exceptionally well we were to be like hey we worked on this algorithm for harvard medical school on genetic search and we sped it up by 10 times what a graduate student who spent a year on improving the algorithm had done for a tenth of the cost yeah. in two weeks so we had these crazy stories what we didn't do as well was scaling down the problems that everybody needed. So how do you build the mundane mobile app with this in an easy way and let somebody maintain it and go through that? And that's some of the challenges that they're still working on. But if we can crack that, that does have the potential to really change how services work because it's impractical to think that Accenture, Deloitte, TCS are going to be million-person firms. The overhead from the infrastructure starts to collapse yeah. on itself. Like I, I met, remember meeting with an executive at Infosys who told me about his city planner for their campus because they had 100,000 people on a campus. It really was a city that they had to plan out. And I was like, that doesn't seem very related to helping your clients. Yeah. Right? It's too far removed. So I really believe in crowdsourcing. But that crowdsourcing exposure to data science and AI is what actually really kind of piqued my personal interest and was the thing I took away from Aperio and is really related to what I want to work on now, which is trying to apply that to healthcare. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but you, you also have done some different things post Aperio, which is you just served six months as the interim executive director of the C Coalition. How did you get involved in that? Yeah. And, and how, does this, how, did, how does your tech background in this relate? How does this all connect? Yeah. So I, um, you know, like many folks, I woke up on the morning of 9-11 and I was living in the Bay Area, but I just moved from New York. Yeah. And I see, you know, I wake up and I see the second the second plane hitting the tower. And I'm, I start calling all my friends in New York. Are you okay? What's going on? And you can't get through. And it's like... It was terrible. It's terrible, yeah. right? And then in about probably two minutes, I was like, I need to call my family in Ohio who works at a grocery store. Because what's going to happen? Right? Yeah. What's going to happen to the taxi driver who's sitting on there? People historically often like look at you know six and they assume the other of the day like when i was young one of the first things i remember is the iran hostage scenario and people thinking oh you now represent iran now you represent this so no matter what it is and you know as a person of faith of the Sikh tradition our values don't say the, the, the wrong answer is like no no that's not me that's somebody else yeah well i'm not that from that country from that religion this shouldn't happen to anybody here in this country and so Seven days, about, about five days after um, 9-11, there was a gentleman named Balbir Singh Sodi who was shot and killed in a, in a gas station that he owned in Phoenix, Arizona by yeah. a patriot. Yeah. Right? And so it really kind of like kind of shook me of like what, what it meant. And the Sikh community in the U.S. had been pretty insular. Like, hey, work hard, study hard, get a yeah. good job, be a doctor, an engineer was kind of the mentality. Um, and that wasn't all of our like, community. We had business owners and taxi drivers like my uncle's. Um, you know, one of my uncles was actually himself shot and killed in a, in a robbery, right? So, so this thinking about all of this, we started a civil rights organization first to kind of point out what was happening to six. That kind of evolved into being a civil rights organization that said, hey, look, the issues that we're facing in bullying or hate crimes or employment discrimination are really the tip of the spear for lots of communities. And so that was the founding of the Sick Coalition. In some ways, it was my first startup. It exists today still. It's about a staff of about 20 based out of New York. And so I, um, I'm serving right now my last term on the board okay. because I believe in succession. It's been a long, much, yeah. very long time. And so this is my last term on the board. And we had a very strong executive director who was great. And she got a fantastic opportunity. She's now the chief development officer at the Girl Scouts. So oh, wow. a great opportunity yeah. for her, you know, an organization two orders of magnitude larger than the Sikh Coalition. And so, you know, this happened in Q4, and nonprofits are just like businesses. Q4 is busy, yeah. right? <laughs> in fact, for I think the average nonprofit, about three quarters of, of its funds come in Q4, if not December, yeah. right? So stability was important. And so I had just finished, I went back to school and done a master's in translational medicine, which I might talk about related to my healthcare pursuits. Timing was good, so I spent six months at the Sick Coalition um, as the interim executive director, and I just transitioned that in March to an incredible woman who's been with the team for eight years, and she's fantastic. Like I'm very excited for her. But it was important for me to do that because obviously the cause is important to me, but even from a cosmic karma perspective, um, you know, the Sick Coalition has had an incredible influence on my professional life, Right. Not because I made some network there or yeah. something like that, but when we first started the Sick Coalition, it kind of grew like a startup. You know, we set values into the yeah. same things I talked about at Aperio. And about four, three, four years in, um, five years in, 
we couldn't do donations on spreadsheets weren't working anymore. Like it was terrible. Like we actually were getting people to give us yeah. money. It was terrible. So I started looking at different solutions. And at the time I was working at SAP and at SAP, I did an expense report once a quarter because it was so hard to use because that's the legacy of enterprise yeah. technology. So I was like at a loss for what we were going to do. I was like, am I going to build this on Microsoft Access? Salesforce had 10 free licenses. So I built the first donor management system for the SIC coalition on salesforce.com. Interesting. Okay. When I started Apurio, salesforce.com was our first strategic partner because I had much more than an academic understanding of how the technology was different. I had a ground up view yeah. that this was a different sort. So that experience, though unrelated professionally in the traditional sense, it wasn't that I had some board relationship. It really kind of set an interesting curve back to that. So when I had the opportunity to kind of you know step in and try to create some stability, that was important. And in fact, I actually, even today, the one thing that I'm carrying forward past the ED spot is really kind of revisiting the core technology infrastructure that we have at the organization today and trying to say, how can we have a $2 million a year organization have a $200 million a year technology infrastructure yeah. because of what's there right now. And I'll, so that also has like yeah, some synergy into yeah. the way I think about the I, world today. How do, you, how do you educate people, though, on on the issues that, that you faced? I mean, coming out of, obviously, 9-11 yeah. and then and just the perception, you know, it, 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 it's not like – it's not like this perception <laughs> is changed completely as much as we want. We think yeah. things are getting better. There's always, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, pitfalls it, and it, stumbles in the road. It's, um, yeah, hate crimes are at a level right now that are uh, at, around post 9 11 area, right? So we've seen, like, at the beginning of the year, we were seeing something like a, a one a week against the sick, not, not more, more generally. Yeah. So, but the, the real answer to that is a couple fold. The first is, like, yes, you want to educate people on who you are, right? Just because I feel like that's. That's something that like we all benefit when that happens. Like I remember one of my conversations with a, a sales rep from a partner in Georgia, and we just somehow got on this topic of how like the musical tradition and the faith and how there's this uh, there's this tension in a lot of a lot of and I'm not a, a musician, but like like the musical tradition in what hymns are sung in is like really kind of a conflict. And then he's talking about his church and how they have the same thing. They got these kids on these guitars and it doesn't sound like the way he grew up. And so two completely different yeah. worlds. And because we were educating one another about who we were, we connected a little bit more yeah. as humans. So that to me is a fundamental thing. But the second thing was really that you, you do actions by showing. So it was, we got more support from the community and I think did a better job educated when we started saying we're going to be, on the front lines of fighting for civil rights for whoever it is, right? So when we went and did a school bullying thing, we got the laws changed in New York City for 2 million kids. We got a, a, a major case one in Georgia, and that affected not sick kids, but you know LGBT, uh, minority kids, people who just felt different. Like It was bullying rules and how to engage yeah. that across the board. We got something passed in California a few years ago called the Workplace Religious Freedom Act. Like that affects a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the population here is sick. The rest of it is everything else. So by fighting for things that you believe in that are universal for, for not just yourself, I feel like that sends a better message for how you're going to contribute to society, not just, hey, take, you know, care, of my, take care of me, me. and don't yeah. worry about everybody else. It's like, how do I give back? Yeah, no, the, the work you've done with Sick Coalition is pretty amazing. I mean, it's I, I, I learned that about you later, and I was sort of like, wow. <laughs> it's, it's cool to see now. There was an episode on CNN and United Shades, uh, a show that's on CNN, that was the first hour-long um, view of who six are in the country that we've had, as far as I know, right? And so it was very rewarding to see different stories. And just like any community, there's not one there's not one story of the six, the six who live here, yeah. right? Like they come from all walks of life, from taxi drivers to store owners to doctors to engineers to CEOs. And so it's a diverse community inside of itself. And to see part of that diversity get captured, not just the victim narrative of a hate crime yeah. or the guy who wears a turban or the woman who wears a turban, it was nice to see a more well-rounded story presented. Well, you've, you've obviously got a pretty pretty wide range of interests. And, and you mentioned it earlier that you decided to kind of pursue a new path and you got a master's in translation medicine translational medicine. translational me what does this mean yeah. i'm 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 like, like yeah. how do you go you're, there you're like most of my tech friends like yeah. some people sometimes when i first you're heard about it they're like documents. are you doing like east and west medicine yeah, combined like what, what is what's this? going on so translational medicine historically is taking something from research and science 
and actually getting it into medical practice. That would be things like drugs and drug mm -hmm. discovery. It'd be things like medical devices. Okay. And so now those medical devices are often becoming more software oriented. But I was very conscious of not being just another techie who wanted to disrupt healthcare, right? <laughs> like that feels like a Silicon Valley yeah, episode, yeah. and Silicon Valley feels like a Hooli, documentary. Hooli actually has a division on that. I'm I heard. sure. I'm yeah. sure. So I Tra was. They call translation medicine. Yes, that's they the call problem. That's where they're going to fail. I yes. Think. Yes, and it's all in a box. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole notion of um, yeah, Silicon Valley has become a little bit more too much of a documentary versus a parody anymore. So I was conscious of that. And I really said, like, hey, look, even if things are going to change, you want to understand what's happening now. So to me, Aperio was a 10-year journey. So the idea of going back to school for a year was felt very natural. It's and, a research uh, phase of your next venture, right? Yeah, and it was fun. It was like I was back with a bunch of early 20-somethings who were incredible. It actually really broke a lot of the stereotypes I have or I had of You love millennials, millennials now. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I think the thing is, just like any one group, like trying to over-categorize a yeah. group just as risky, right? And there's there's all sorts of different things. I think one thing that is true and was very true in a translational medicine program is that people cared about giving back to something more than just the bottom line, yeah. right? So for me, it was an opportunity to learn an industry and really pay respect to that industry and then be able to say, okay, I've at least made an attempt to understand what's happening. Now I'm going to try to change it. And I'm not going to, you know, just accept the status quo. I am going to try to change it. But it's not because I just simply assume the status quo is broken without ever doing any diligence. So for me, it was an incredibly powerful year, no matter what happens. Um, and I feel very fortunate that opportunity to do that. And so what do you, what's next? So I'm in the process right now of trying to start a company. Um, I will hopefully start something in healthcare. For, I will start something in healthcare, but hopefully yeah. something in healthcare technology related to the medical care process. I'm not as interested in problems around billing or on the periphery, yeah. not because they're not important, but because one of the reasons of getting into this was to have something that I could have an opportunity to give back, yeah. you know, in a way that my day job and night job didn't feel quite, quite so disconnected. So I'd like to be something closer to clinical care. So I'm working on a bunch of things. If something doesn't work out in one of those, what I'll most likely try to do is go get a job applying technology to a health system and not the top tier brand name UCSF, Harvard and Brigham's, but something a little more mainstream and trying to actually apply technology to their problems. And then hopefully that would lead to a company. Yeah. But even if not, at least I did something yeah. worthwhile. Change so, the outcome for yeah, the patient. Like and... for example, one of the things I did once I left Aperio is I put, helped put in technology platform for an amazing nonprofit called City Health Works, he City Health Works that's doing community health workers in Harlem in, in, uh, in, in New York. And that was an incredible experience for me because I got to see what health coaching looked like. And I got to put it in a tech infrastructure that could help them at least scale past the initial parts. All right. We got a little bit of time left here. And I want to we're going to totally shift gears yep. to one of your passions. Mm -hmm. You are a self-professed basketball nerd <laughs> like myself. Yeah. Who's the one person you'd like to uh, most have coffee with so, in the um, NBA? My stereotypical answer would be Michael Jordan, but everybody would say that. Yeah. I grew up in Chicago. I have a different answer now. So if you haven't listened to it, there's a great uh, podcast called Road Trippin' yeah. that Richard Jefferson and Channing Fry do. And in that, they interview Tim Duncan in what's the most hilarious 45 minutes I've ever heard because it's literally more than he spoke in his entire career to the media. And you just discover a completely different side of who Tim Duncan is. So my answer right now, if he would be that open, would I would – and Tim, if you're listening, I'm happy to come down to San Antonio. <laughs> Let's go shoot some paintballs. I'm happy to check out the car detailing place. And he just like – he's so much more of a person than you would expect. And so I expect that's true for a lot of people. But right now it would be Tim Duncan. That's awesome. Well, we unfortunately don't have any more time on this episode. But we're going to definitely have Narinder back. Are you going to come back? I would love to come we're back. We're going to do this. We're going to talk about all sorts of crazy stuff. Basketball, health care, who knows what. But uh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thanks thank for you, coming Jason. on. Now, you probably learned on this podcast a lot of great things. Going to dinner with me eating sushi. It's always an expensive proposition. That one always makes me laugh and cringe when I hear about it. But it just goes to show you how a moment like that can lead to a great business opportunity and an even better friendship. Thanks so much to Narendra Singh for coming on this episode of the Grow Wire podcast and to everyone on the team who made it possible. Our sponsors at Ring, Steiner Sports, Blue Microphones, as well as our editing crew over at Lampstand and our producer, Kendall Fisher. Adios. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Jason Maynard. Make sure to tune in every week for another episode full of tips, tools, and strategies to take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time. <laughs>